Health, and we are quite honored to have a very relevant and interesting topic, and it's delivered by Dr. Richard Skolnick. Let me please start by a brief introduction. It could be a very long introduction. Many of you read uh, the incredible achievements and experience and expertise Dr. Skolnick has, but um, on behalf of the special, you know, uh, special interest group on global health, I'd just like to highlight a couple. Um, Journal Dr. Skolnick has spent more than 40 years working in a global health area and international development. He is author, if you've never read, please do. It's quite intriguing and very um, interesting book. And it really takes you on the journey to global health. It's called Global Health 101 which now has been re-edited multiple times, and he continues to work as an instructor at Yale Coursera course. Richard has spent 25 years at the World Bank, and he retired in the position of the Director of Health and Education for the South Asia region. I don't think actually there is any region in the world where Richard did not work. Um, so I'm not going to go over the regions, but they spent anywhere from Asian world to Latin America to Africa and very diverse areas of Africa for those of us who work there. After leaving the World Bank, Richard was the vice president of the international programs at Population Reference Bureau. And many of us here at the, uh, um, uh, GW have come across him in the role of the director of Center of Global Health at the George Washington University. He taught undergraduate global health courses for eight years. He also served in a very distinguished role of executive director of the Harvard PEPFAR program, race treatment in Botswana, Nigeria, and Tanzania. And just to let you all know that in specifically in uh, Botswana, that's one of the latest data sets that we have seen on the new formulations of dolutegravir and women and really move the whole field of looking at the pregnancy and antiretroviral drug exposures through different lands. He also worked a lot with the World Health Organization, a multiple advisor and working groups, uh, worked particularly in the area of TB, establishment of Stop CB initiative and results for development institute also known as R4D institute that particularly focused on financing of HIV work which is very keen to my heart in India, Cambodia, and Nigeria and uh, multiple multiple um, textbooks and uh, chapter contributions and publications and again as I mentioned Richard continues to be very strongly involved with Yale and with multiple other invitations like the one that we have right now. He also served at the board of director uh, of North Virginia Hebrew congregation and multiple other Jewish organization, cultural organizations outside of his uh, work engagement. And I just keep being amazed how one man can um, uh, embrace such a wide array of activities and be known and be proactive there. Um, just before we started, we were sharing wonderful news um, and Los Alamos Daily Post uh, looks like Richard, you are contributing a lot to the local newspaper where you live right now. So in general, I think I will finish my introduction by saying I introduce you a very vibrant speaker very provocative speaker, differently speaking speaker with incredible wealth of expertise and knowledge in a global health. And the talk today will be focusing why in the era of COVID epidemic and the totally new experiences lived by many of us, the global health actually should become more important to us and we should not sit in the silo of our Western world of medicine where we have been focusing so much in the last 12 months. So thank you so much for attending. And I welcome you, Dr. Skolnick, to give your talk. Well, uh, Dr. Amana, thank you so much. It's extraordinarily kind of you to both invite me and then to say such uh, very nice uh, things about me. Uh, I'm deeply honored to be um, invited and deeply honored to be speaking with uh, people as distinguished and as talented and as committed to making the world better place as Dr. Rabmanana and all of you. Uh, I'm uh, also very honored and privileged to be speaking uh, at Children's since I lived for over 40 years in the DC area. And just about 40 years ago, Children's actually treated my son for, at the time, what appeared to be a zebra. Uh, and uh, I should say thanks partly to the good work of the fine people at Children's. He actually turned out okay. Uh, he's the real Dr. Skolnick, and he's now an intensivist at the Mayo Clinic in, uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona. And as you can imagine, rather busy with um, seeing COVID patients as well as more. I'm going to say, if it's convenient for you to turn on your cameras, uh, I, I would appreciate it because it allows me to relate to you 
in easier ways. On the other hand, I would certainly respect if you prefer not to turn on your cameras, that's, that's also okay. Um, so uh, let me say a word or two about the aims of the today's uh, brief remarks. Now, last year, I gave a talk in Sarasota, Florida called Why One Should Care About Global Health. This was made to the World Affairs Council in Sarasota. I suggested then a number of reasons why global health should be so important to everyone. In some respects, I should say quite sadly, much of what I talked about turned out to be true or too true. And so a year from the date of that talk, the World Affairs Council in Sarasota invited me back to give, I don't know if you wanna call it a post-mortem or if you wanna call it an unendowed annual lecture, but I was asked to come back and talk again, this time about why one should care even more about global health than the year before. Dr. Rachmanina has kindly asked me today to build on my earlier remarks in Sarasota and elsewhere and comment on why I think it's so important to care even more now about global health and even more than I suggested three months ago to the World Affairs Council in Sarasota. So what I'd like to do is make about 20 or 25 minutes of remarks on this question and then open up for questions uh, uh, from the audience. <clears throat> As you know, I've spent um, a long time working in global health uh, and development. Uh, I spent now a long time uh, teaching global health as well. And therefore I hope that you'll take advantage of the uh, question and answer period so that we can have a wide ranging uh, engagement on a, a variety of global health topics that are of uh, most concern to you. So let me begin by saying why I think global health is so important in the first place. Uh, in my book and in my teaching, I suggest there are a number of reasons why global health should be important to everyone, everywhere, all the time. And um, you'll know much of this, but I hope nonetheless that I can be helpful to your thinking about these matters, perhaps in more conceptual ways, or perhaps with some frameworks you might not have considered yourself. Uh, and I hope uh, that my presence today will add some value to your thinking and honor the kind invitation. First of all, diseases don't respect boundaries and globalization has increased the speed with which diseases can spread across boundaries. Look at HIV, SARS, MERS, Zika, Dengue, West Nile, and COVID-19 as a small number of examples of the extent to which diseases don't respect boundaries and the extent to which they can spread and spread ever more rapidly in an increasingly globalized world. Second, there's an ethical dimension to health and to well being, wherever you are. As you know well, around 5 million under five children die uh, in the world every single year. And as you all know better than almost anyone else, almost all of these deaths are needless and are preventable. So we could ask ourselves ethically, is this okay? You know, is it acceptable that 13 or 14 747s full of kids should fly out of the sky and crash every day because that's the equivalent of what's happening? Um, is it acceptable when we know what can be done, but it's not being done for us to sit back and watch this happen? In addition, we know that there are substantial variances in many countries in access to water, sanitation, food security, and health services, often by ethnicity. Is it ethical for countries to perpetuate the lack of services for their minority people? Uh, although I lived 42 years in the, in the DC area, 40 in Reston, I now live in New Mexico. As I'm sure you know, New Mexico has the second largest share of Native American people outside of Alaska of any state in the United States. And around one third of the Native Americans in New Mexico do not have easy access to safe drinking water in what I think is 2021, however difficult it is 
for us to understand, believe, or accept that. Third, health is closely linked with economic and social development in an increasingly interdependent world. Unhealthy children don't thrive, they don't succeed in school, they don't become productive adults. Another example close to your hearts, no doubt, would be HIV, which has had an enormous economic and social impact on a range of societies. It has led, for example, to a large number of deaths in many countries. Um, many people who have been ill often for a long time, the creation of AIDS orphans, and the continuing cost in many countries of keeping a large number of people and often a large share of their population on antiretroviral therapy. Fourth, the health and well being of people everywhere has important links with security and freedom. And I'm sure most of you will remember that uh, quite a long time ago, but about 20 years ago, the notion of these links between health, security, and freedom were actually raised by the US Department of Defense as they looked at what was going on in the world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, with the large number of people who were becoming infected with HIV prior to the advent of antiretroviral therapy. But today we could say outbreaks of plague, cholera, SARS and Ebola had overwhelming and sometimes unbearable economic costs on a number of countries. What are the long-term implications for societies in which a large share of their population is overweight, is obese, and a growing share of people have diabetes? Finally, global health problems by definition cannot be solved, no matter how much some countries or some leaders believe it, by unilateral actions within countries. Rather, they require cooperative actions across countries. This is true of annual efforts to deal with influenza. It's true of the need to share knowledge about emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. It's true about the global effort to eradicate polio. Cooperation is also needed for the development and distribution <clears throat> of new diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccine. And there are a number of issues that are really clearly way beyond the scope of any individual country. They're really supranational, and tobacco consumption is one of them. So if we want to um, reduce tobacco consumption within countries and across countries, we need to ensure that we cooperate across countries to take on the efforts of the tobacco companies companies to get as many people to smoke as possible. So, you know, we could say, well, if these truths are self-evident, as Thomas Jefferson might have said, why are they even more true now? And why do we need more than before to embrace them? So to answer that question, what I'd like to do is look at the, look through the prism of COVID-19 at the points that I just raised above. And I'm gonna go through them one at a time excuse me, and then use COVID uh, as uh, an example for their examination. Uh, I don't drink, so pardon me if I take a sip of pomegranate juice and water. So first, when it comes to interdependent, to the interdependent boundaryless world in which we're living, as I said, I would also say with a little more elaborate way, the health of anyone anywhere is the health of everyone everywhere all the time. COVID highlights this in exceptional ways. The disease appears to have begun in China. It then spread elsewhere. It spread to the US apparently from China and from some other countries such as Italy. Today, it appears that the virus is universal uh, or almost universal depending on whether we believe uh, the occasional dictator about a country that might not have any COVID-19. In addition, and I don't need to tell you this, viruses mutate. A number of prominent mutations of this virus have already occurred and they've begun to spread widely, including those first discovered in the UK, in South Africa, and in Brazil. This has happened, of course, despite many lockdowns 
and expend extensive barriers to travel. Second, on the ethical side, this virus has certainly highlighted a number of critical eth ethical issues in a manner I think unseen since the early days of HIV. First have been the ethics of travel bans. Next is the ethics of lockdowns. Then there are the ethics related to mask wearing. After that, there's a range of ethical issues that relate to prioritization for vaccination within countries and prioritization for vaccination across countries, which most people don't even wanna talk about. On the clinical side, there's a range of ethical issues related to crisis standards of care. COVID-19 has also highlighted issues of health equity as minority groups have died at much higher rates than majority groups, but usually the minority groups have less access to care and less access to vaccination than the better off groups. When we think about economics, I don't know if this virus will finally convince countries in the world to stop moving from what some of these reports have called from complacency to panic every time there's a new emerging or re-emerging infectious disease. However, what we can say is that the economic costs of this pandemic have been beyond measure. And if this pandemic doesn't convince countries and the world to get together to do better the next time, I, I have to say, sadly, uh, I, I don't know, I really don't know what will. Let me make it simple if I can. Um, the economic crisis that confronts, confronts many countries and the globe right now originates in a public health crisis. This is not because of a lack of demand. This is not because of high inflation. This is not because of a banking crisis. This is unlike anything we've seen in modern times. Um, and, I, and I'm appalled regularly at the extent to which many people including many outstanding public policymakers and economists still don't seem to get this. People have not stopped flying because planes are crashing. People have not stopped traveling because there's no place to go. They have not stopped dining in restaurants because the food is bad. They're not working at home because this has been everybody's preferred way to work. No, they've changed their behaviors because of a virus that some countries allowed to get out of control. And people will not resume normal economic activity until the virus is controlled. I, I don't know what can be simpler. And I repeat, I absolutely don't understand why so many people don't get this. The costs of, bit of the virus have been unbearable for many families. They've lost their loved ones, their jobs, and their incomes. They've been at risk of losing basic services in their homes. By the end of 2020, as you know, about 500,000 people had died in the United States alone from COVID. This is as many as had died in the military in World War II. <clears throat> and globally, as of yesterday, almost 2.7 million people have now died from COVID-19. Uh, by comparison, I think you know for HIV, there's about a million, 900,000 people or so a year who die globally in the world of HIV-related conditions. There's just a, a bit more than that who die every year, for example, of tuberculosis. And TB is the leading infectious cause of death in the world, as I'm sure you know. At the community level, there's been a loss of tax revenues and in many places, a loss of businesses. Many countries have also seen their national economic product shrink more than any time since the Great Depression. In one quarter of 2020, in fact, the gross domestic product of the United States declined by 9%, which was three times the largest decline uh, since um, such data had been kept uh, beginning in 1947. COVID-19 also wiped out in the United States 113 straight months of job growth. So let me repeat, this is a public health crisis that reflects daily the wide ranging economic and social impact of a pandemic and the costs of failing to control it while there was a chance to do so. We will not return to anything like normal life until we in the United States and many other countries 
do much better in getting a grip on the virus. COVID has also raised in a kind of related way to this, an array of questions about security and freedom. Children have suffered greatly from the lack of in-person schooling and for many, the lack of any schooling at all. Uh, I don't know what this means for the future and I don't know what it means for the future of their countries. People have neglected needed healthcare. I don't know what this will mean for their future and the future costs of caring for them, but I think uh, the implications will be and have already been very substantial. The virus has become as, pol as political as scientific. Mask wearing is a political issue in many places. Social distancing is also seen as some, in some places as an infringement on civil rights. Important segments of different populations do not wish to be immunized, often because they refuse to recognize the importance and the virulence of this virus. In some respects, we could say, well, all of this seems normal in the United States, where behaviors often reflect the political divide. However, we have people in the UK who think COVID comes from exposure to 5G. And recently, even in the Netherlands, which I know Dr. Romanina has great affection for as I do, there have been protests against mask wearing and lockdowns, despite the long tradition in the Netherlands of high levels of security and freedom on the one hand, but great levels of orderliness, shall I say, on the other. Moreover, COVID has brought out the ugliness, that's an opinion word, of unilateralism and vaccine nationalism rather than multilateralism and cooperation. I'm not sure, shall we say, how good this can be either for world security and freedom. And lastly, COVID has highlighted the need to work globally on a number of health issues and the dangers and the costs of failing to do so. One part of the US failure to control COVID relates in the early days of the outbreak in the United States to the unwillingness of the US to cooperate in the use of tests which were developed elsewhere. WHO had already approved tests for the virus that had been developed, I believe in Germany, but the US decided to develop its own test. That turned out to be fraught with problems and delays which were absolutely instrumental in helping the virus to gain a foothold in the United States. In addition, as you know, there's been a worldwide free-for-all on the purchase of personal protective equipment. The US also briefly left the World Health Organization, accusing it of being a pawn of the Chinese. And vaccine nationalism, as I mentioned, is rife, but in my view, completely counterproductive as long as you believe that we're all at risk as long as the virus is circulating someplace else in the world. So let me end by making some remarks on, um, in light of this, what then do I think COVID says about global health? Uh, and let me end by saying, I hope I've reinforced your views about why every one of us must care uh, so much about global health uh, and hopefully even more about global health than before. So I think the lessons uh, in, in this light are something like the following five points. Number one, uh, we in the world need to prepare now for the next pandemic. Such, it's probably too late already, but if we, <laughs> if we, if we haven't, and I, I Sadly, I'm actually a pretty funny guy, and in some respects, it's disappointing that I've devoted my life to topics of such seriousness. On the other hand, I hope that I've made the world a slightly better place, uh, and I hope we can at least chuckle a tiny bit in some friendly exchanges in the question and answer. Again, number one, we need to prepare now for the next pandemic. Such preparation must be ethical, it must be equitable, and it must be universal in scope. It must include, for example, advanced market commitments on personal protective equipment, diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. It must also include arrangements in advance for access, the access of low and middle income countries to diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines at the same time as they are made available to high income countries. 
arrangements like COVAX need to be put in place now for the next pandemic. These must include agreements on patents, on licensing and on tiered pricing that will ensure timely and universal access to all countries in the most open and transparent ways, particularly if governments themselves have been so instrumental in financing the research and development for these diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Secondly, uh, we, many countries, urgently need to strengthen their own public health capacity. The US needs to do this at every level. In the last two decades, the United States has hemorrhaged public health workers at every level. Local public health authorities have lost tens of thousands of staff over the last decade alone. And to be polite to an organization uh, with which I worked extensively and for which I've always had profound respect, I think it would be entirely fair to say that CDC needs to rebuild itself from the rubble that in many respects it has become in the last, um, last um, four or five years. As you know, and as I mentioned, COVID-19 has led to an increase in non-COVID related mortality in many countries as people delayed or failed to seek care for acute and chronic conditions. Almost all countries need to prepare their health systems for more continued, more effective, and more efficient operation during a pandemic. You know, if we were, I mean, we've almost been out of business, so to speak, but companies have contingency plans. They're supposed to have continuity plans and much of the world has miserably failed to prepare a continuity plan for dealing with a life in a pandemic. And we need now desperately to improve in that domain. We need a World Health Organization, in my view, that's staffed to lead the world's work on pandemic preparedness and response, and whose financing is not tied up in donor financed trust funds. There also has to be a universal mechanism for dealing with non-compliance with the international health regulations. As long as countries can just keep doing what they want to do and nobody's prepared to do anything about it, I worry greatly about how much better we're going to do in addressing pandemics than be, uh, or, or even important outbreaks than before. And, and lastly, let me say that, second to lastly, we also need to own up now uh, on other threats that could bury us completely, both domestically and globally, such as antimicrobial resistance which may have been made worse by this virus and on which precious little progress has been made in the last 30 years. I will say on that one, 30 years ago, uh, I attended with Jeff Copeland, who was the director of CDC, the launch of a World Health Organization report on antimicrobial resistance. And I can say with profound disappointment, not, Jeff, not Jeff's fault, I assure you, I can say with profound disappointment, when you look at the world today, you say, well, what's going on in the last 30 years? The last thing I'd like to say is, as, as I'm sure you know, the US, there were two important reports that came out prior to this pandemic. One from the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the other from the Nuclear Threat Initiative in Hopkins. And they rated the uh, readiness of countries to deal with pandemics. And, pan and the United States got a 70 out of 100 and rated the best of all countries. But when you go back and look at these very thoughtful, I think very well done reports, you'll see there was one metric that was missing that was extraordinarily important. And that is, there was no metric for whether or not, even if you were ready, you were prepared and willing to act in a committed way. So I think the other thing we need to do is, both in the short run and the long run, we need to uh, advocate, uh, we need to incentivize leaders, we need to be merciless in demanding outstanding leadership, um, which for example, you saw in every single place which has been able to more or less suppress the virus. There were people who knew something about public health, they cared about public health, they took what they knew, they consistently messaged, et cetera. And in the end of the day, and I uh, certainly this is one of my most important lessons from 40 some years of work on health and development, um, there isn't a substitute for leadership 
And that's another area I think all of us have an obligation to ensure that we demand from all levels of the political establishment. So again, please accept my renewed thanks for the opportunity to meet with you. Uh, I'm very honored and very grateful that, for the chance to do so. Uh, I'm sure I'll learn a lot from you in the questions and answers. If you were undergraduate students, I would promise you that I would be taking names. And if you didn't ask questions, I would ensure you never got a job in global health. Happily, you're all great people of great talent already working in uh, the health domain. But nonetheless, I hope we can take advantage of this for an interesting exchange. And I give it back to the doctor. Uh, and please call me Richard. I, I, uh, I'm not licensed. Um, I'm just uh, experienced and committed. So thank you very much again. And I completely at your disposal. Well, thank you, Richard. Let me start by this very provocative and very uh, open and very strongly stated opinions, which are very good to us to start a conversation exchange. Uh, I will start in while the people are waiting for questions. Please uh, um, ask questions. Any, I will need your guidance because I, did, I was going to say, will I see the hands or the chat box? Um, how would you like to run the oh, questions? Yeah, if anybody yeah. wants to ask a question, how do you want to run it, Annie? Yeah, a hands are hands are hands are okay in a sense. I think it personalizes, but of course, people have to turn on their cameras so we can. Well, you, um, if people can turn on their cameras again, it'll be more fun and more interesting. But I don't want to burden anybody unduly. But whichever is whichever is convenient. Hands are. Let's start with hands, but please also feel free to put questions in the chat box. We have twenty five minutes or so, and I hope we can have an exciting engagement. Right. Well, if anybody is ready to ask the questions, I will look for your hands. Oh, I see Pam. Uh, thank you. Or oh, even in the chat box, if you want to raise thumbs up, I will know that you want to ask the question if you are not on the video. Pam, please go ahead. Uh, unmute, Pam. Unmute. Unmuted. It just doesn't come across very well. My apologies. It's my laptop. That's okay. Uh, but Richard, I, your words really resonated with me. And let me tell you that the phrase that resonated the most was, don't tolerate poor leadership. And I'm really bothered about myself for the last four years because in many ways I feel I did tolerate that. At first, because I trusted our um, political system more than I should have. And I would like to invite you to offer a few more words about what to do to show um, unwillingness to follow poor leadership. So you know, thank you very much, Pam. It's a pleasure to meet you and thank you for your thoughtful question. So, you know, every so often people would say, my, I write these weekly articles for the local newspaper. My daughter vets them so I don't offend anybody in a county of 20,000 people where everybody's a physicist besides me. I live in White Rock, which is the next town across the canyon from Los Alamos. And it's part of the national lab. Everybody here but me, you know, works pretty much at the national laboratory. And, um, and, and these articles uh, have led to lots of discussion. And every so often I get attacked for being too political. But I want to suggest to you that everything is political. I, I regard politics as the um, engagement in which people engage, uh, uh, the engagement people undertake to deal with the fact that resources are always, always limited and decisions must almost always be made about how to uh, invest and allocate them. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, therefore, if you accept that, you know, everything is political. And I think those of us who work in health need to um, be involved in advocacy on a regular basis uh, at every level. Uh, if we find that our county, city, county, state officials are not engaging in good public health practices. I think we have an ethical uh, and professional obligation to uh, do what we can to advocate on behalf of better, more appropriate, more doable, sustainable, and fair uh, policies and approaches. And then I think we should not only not be ashamed, but I think we have to vote for candidates at every level who have the interest of the public at heart uh, and are more likely to be able to manage a response to a pandemic than some of what we've seen in a number of countries uh, in the world. And again, you know, I mean, I had the uh, good fortune to work at the World Bank for 25 years and to have spent lots of time working in health and development since then. But at the end of the day, it's all about leadership. It's all about the ability to move people. And you cannot find, I just put out a little article on messaging um, 
which I can share, you know, with the doctor to share with you. But, you know, at the end of the day, whether it's HIV in Thailand or in Uganda in the, in, in the, in, in the better phase, uh, or if it's Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, now, when you look at the, at the um, what do you call them, correlates of protection, right? When you look at the correlates of success, they're always the same. They're always thoughtful, engaged political leaders who have consistently shown a commitment to their people, who care about science and the evidence, who let their scientists and practitioners uh, do their work, and then message, 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 message in consistent, thoughtful ways that help to get everybody rowing in the same direction. And I don't need to tell you, and I, um, when you look at the US response, you say, if these are the traditional correlates of protection for anything, from polio elimination in Northern India or Northern Nigeria, to uh, HIV in Thailand with the great you know, Michai, it's always the same. And the US failed on almost every one of these counts, uh, I think. So I think in all of those, so I, I'm not suggesting I should be a role model. My, child, my son says, by contrast, I should be cloned and forced to live with myself to see what it's like. <laughs> but he's saving, he's saving that for my eulogy. But uh, I, think, I think what I'm trying to do is uh, explicitly, I write almost weekly articles for the local press. Uh, it's a small place where almost nobody besides my daughter, who's also, also a global health person, knows much about global health, even though everybody here thinks they know more about this than Tony Fauci does. This is just part of the, of, the, of the milieu at the national lab here, you know, where everybody's been to Princeton and, and Caltech and MIT. There's more armchair epidemiologists per square foot here than any place you ever met, but lots of talented people. So what I'm trying to do uh, with my daughter's help is influence the local scene by providing inputs from people who have a long career in these areas in an area where people have not been sensitive enough to what they don't know and then to plug into the state and at their request to help a little bit there. And then have my friends who are influential take my writings and if they find them valuable, use them for their own good purposes. I'm, I'm not suggesting um, this should be a model for, for anyone, but I am suggesting I continue to feel that I have an ethical obligation to ensure that I am not silent in the face of what's going on and that what I've been lucky enough to learn and engage in I can put to some good use. Um, so, um, and I'll now be serving, we have a look, the state is mandated that every county has to have a health council. Uh, the people it chose don't know that my daughter is my daughter. So happily my daughter and I will both be on the health council in what I'm attempting to, uh, to, uh, to help the health council by engineering a number of young talented people. As you may know, the National Lab has an outstanding modeling group and an outstanding group that works on, uh, I think you can call it computational biology. And has been very instrumental, as I'm sure you know, in the development of one of the vaccines under Betty Korber's leadership. So the modeling group I plugged into and um, uh, in, mostly by helping the Unitarians here think about reopening. So again, I'm, I'm not suggesting, but I, I would encourage everybody to think about the, the obligations they, I hope feel toward trying to keep making the world a better place and engage in at least advocacy, advocacy if not more. Um, I think what's happened in the United States was utterly and completely um, inexcusable and avoidable. And we really have to ensure this doesn't happen again. Thank you so much. No, no, thank you very much. I'm honored that you would be here. I will continue uh, Pam question in a way, Richard, and kind of take on that subject of advocacy. And I want to reference the example of HIV. We have seen over years the fatigue to HIV messaging. And I'm now looking at the COVID and I'm wondering if you have any timeline, or is there any um, thinking you, know, you can share in the line of COVID fatigue? I mean, we clearly, I've seen the public fatigue uh, in some stages and I'm hearing that more. And I will share uh, just even my son who is a now young employee graduate first year after college working in New York and his milieu of young people who are viewed the least susceptible but high spreading group. 
there's been a high level of discipline uh, in among himself and his friends of all these months in terms of being young and yet not being able to live the young life the way they imagined they would be living. But what I'm hearing more, and I'm still grateful, he is very responsible. We have very elderly. Um, my mother lives with us, so there is a great respect and concern on his way of how he lives his life. But in his milieu of young uh, college graduates that graduated on virtual platform, I'm seeing definitely a growing fatigue of COVID and kind of attitude. And this is on a personal use level, but I'm thinking more of it as a first signal of the general um, public fatigue and whether it will expand into our mentality. And again, this is largely based on the HIV. I'm a strong advocate, but I have come across audiences when I start talking HIV, people roll their eyes and they like say, well, it's been already, we all know it's in Africa, come on. You know, kind of this topic is, is pushed back on the grill of the discussion. So with COVID acuity and everybody, as you said, was one delay or another one, but eventually accepted in the global level, this new world, um, how soon do you think the world will, will move on on forgetting this experience and not putting it to service? So, Dr. Thank you. I think this is an extraordinarily important question. Uh, I think the answer is very soon. I think we have an extremely limited timeline for either succeeding in at least controlling the outbreak, because uh, I don't think we're gonna suppress it completely, or I think basically uh, we're lost. And I think we're gonna be lost both uh, technically and clinically, but more than that, I think we're gonna be lost politically. Because if it turns out that um, you know, we, we, we uh, encourage these behaviors for a long time, we close schools for a long time, we close business for a long time, we push people to get vaccinated and it takes five or six months to do that. And then we lose to the variants, let's say. Mm -hmm. And we immediately start revaccinating everybody while we're telling people, please, please don't go back to normal. You know, I think we're going to be lost. I think we're going to be living with a public in many societies that becomes more like the one in the United States, which has traditionally had a limited amount of respect for and appreciation of the role of government. Um, that you know will become kind of more libertarian, more interested in doing their own thing, and for quite some time in the future, will be much less interested in engaging in appropriate behaviors and consent and in a communitarian way, trying to make the world a better place. So you know, I, I uh, you all are technically competent. I'm not. I mean, I read two three hours a day about COVID that I don't want to do, but I I think we are in an absolute race, both against complacency and against um, mutations. And if we don't um, control this virus by er early summer, uh, I really wonder um, how hard it will be after that to get an important share of the American and even global population to, uh, to engage after that. I, I think it's a very short timeline. Very, very short. I think it's an extraordinarily important question. I wish I had, <laughs> I have a lot of great jokes. I have a lot of great stories. I uh, got a lot of great animal pictures from animals showing up in my backyard. But uh, I, on this one, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite concerned, if not petrified, that we have an extremely short window after which bringing people along will become essentially impossible for some time to come. Peter, please go ahead. Yes, yes, I see you. Uh, unmute yourself. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear yes, me okay? Perfect, okay. yes, perfect, perfect, yes. Richard, uh, thank you for a very stimulating uh, and, and informative talk. Um, as clinicians um, with our patients and as uh, neighbors, uh, excuse me, as citizens with our neighbors, uh, can you suggest most effective ways to to deal with the vaccine reluctance on a one-on-one -on -one basis, um, um, uh, you know, in in these micro circumstances, how can we take the most advantage of opportunities? So, uh, th thank you, Peter. It's very gracious of you to to be here, and thank you for your kind remarks. I mean, uh, you know, there's there is th this is um, as you as you all know, I'm sure better than me. 
uh, vaccine hesitancy is as local uh, as any issue in public or global health. You know, HIV is local. In one place in India, the virus is spread by men who have sex unprotected with commercial sex workers. In Punjab, it's spread by people largely uh, who inject uh, drugs. Um, and you can't look at India and suggest what needs to be done without looking at, you know, uh, uh, at the Northeast, Punjab, Bombay, Chennai, et cetera. And my understanding about vaccine hesitancy, uh, including work on the Global Polio Initiative um, and seeing Nigeria and India, two of the great examples of hesitancy in the north of both of those, is that again, this is an extraordinarily local phenomenon which needs to be handled in very local ways. My understanding is that in the United States, um, it seems to, it, it appears that among the best approaches is quiet conversations with people about what it would take for them to imagine vaccinating themselves or their children, at least the latest things I've been reading. And that, um, other approaches, uh, including mercilessly beating them up, no matter how much they might deserve it in the view of some of us, uh, don't seem to work at all. But with your permission, what I'll do is, uh, you know, I, um, one, of, one of the leading thinkers in the US right now is Saad Omer, who went recently from Emory to, the, to, uh, to Yale. And uh, Peter Hotez, who was at GW before, who many of you will know and is a dear friend, of course, has done some really wonderful work. I, I'm going to try to find a few snippets, but my understanding is uh, of the many things that people have tried, it appears in the United States that um, quiet conversations focusing on what would it take and then trying to respond as professionals to their responses, if they'll give them to you, appears to be the most successful. You know, I, I also, um, I wonder, but I've been told I'm wrong, whether or not more forceful approaches to helping people understand the terrible nature of COVID would be helpful. So with seat belts, you know, and, and uh, drunk driving, we put pictures on television of kids wrapping themselves around telephone poles. And every kid at school got to see pictures of people being wrapped around telephone poles when they, when they were out drunk driving. With tobacco consumption, every kid's gotten to see pictures of what your lungs look like after 20 years of smoking uh, Pall Malls or Marlboros. I wonder, but my friends who know more than me tell me I shouldn't wonder about whether or not we could help people to understand better the um, exceptional nature of this virus by being a little bit more brutal about it in some settings at least where maybe focus groups and other things have said people will respond. And finally, at some stage, enough people are gonna die in the United States that almost everybody will know somebody who's died. And um, you would think that that might help. But again, I'm sure Peter, you have far more experience. I mean, my experience is all global with the Global Program on X, the Global Program on Immunization. I've gotten to very fortunately work with you know, all of the great gods and goddesses of this, but that's, those are some of my understandings and some of the questions that I have, but I'll find a few, a few uh, small pieces and, and share them if I think that they can add any enlightenment. What, what would you say, Peter? I mean, please, what, what, do you, what would you say will work? Well, I would like to say uh, appealing to reason and rational yeah. behavior would, would be the answer, but uh, I've had so many examples where that hasn't, hasn't been the case. Way, way back, I can, I can think when I was running a, um, a pediatric service in the Indian Health Service, I would explain to every parent uh, about the, uh, why circumcise their children, and they would listen patiently. Um, and, and then invariably would say, no, I, I want it done. <laughs> and and uh, um, so uh, and, and my, in my experience, the majority of people that I've encountered who are um, uh, reluctant tend to have, tend to be, you know, conservative, um, um, you know, um, Trump supporting uh, uh, individuals and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, appealing to re reason I've, has been very difficult. Um, so, uh, uh, 
but I, but I think your your uh, your suggestion of quiet conversation and keeping it as apolitical as possible um, could serve could serve well. I, I don't have any other special insights. Where did you work in the IHS, Peter? Oh, I worked in uh, uh, in in Alaska, in uh, the Northwest, and in the Southwest with the Apaches and Pimas and uh, Navajos. In, in Arizona or in New Mexico? In, in, in Arizona, I was at the Indian, the uh, <clears throat> um, uh, Phoenix Indian Medical Center, and in in Alaska, I was in the Southeast in a little little town well, called Sitka. I'll have to badger you for some uh, help. <laughs> On the uh, a section I'm doing, I'm going to do on Indigenous peoples in my fifth edition. But and and thank you for your all of you for your important work. I think the other yeah. thing interesting on Native Americans, Peter, on this very matter right now is so among the Navajo in New Mexico, they have the highest rates of vaccination coverage in the state right now, being run through the IHS. And basically, the message there from Jonathan Nez, the head of the Navajo Nation, and others is, we will lose all of our elders. We cannot. Our culture is now as at much at risk from COVID as anything that's happened to us historically. We must, as a nation, vaccinate everybody, starting with our elders. And their rates have been very high. By contrast, I was reading today in the Cherokee Nation, there's enormous amount of vaccine hesitancy. I don't know enough about the difference between the two groups, but it's really interesting, the contrast. But certainly here in New Mexico, uh, and the Navajo, as you know, were blitzed. Uh, early on, completely blitzed by the outbreak. The rates of uh, uh, uptake have been very high and hesitancy have been very low. I don't know about uh, the other side of the, you know, the border. But and I think you Richard, you just, give, you. you just give a brilliant example, I think, of the cultural sensitive messaging around the vaccine. And I think you and Dr. Scheid started with a very good point of quiet conversation. I just want to share experience of children's with our population of HIV infected patients in care. As you know, children started patient vaccination campaign last week. And I do know that the return, uh, all eligible patients, and there is a very big and devoted group that worked on those lists that really prioritize patients at the highest risk within the approved age. And these are mostly um, young adults and uh, adolescents, uh, late adolescents and young adults. So I do want to say that what I hear is that the response to this text that the vaccine is available are quite low. And what we have done in our program is literally calling every single patient on the list. I mean, we have resources, not every program can afford it. We are Ryan White supported program. Therefore there is a medical case management built in the model. And I can tell you that many of the patients and children, young people living with HIV, the initial response was no. And these are people with even comorbidity that just HIV doesn't put you at risk for higher morbidity. With COVID, we know that, we've seen it. People living with HIV do not seem to get more frequently ill or have higher morbidity. But nevertheless, those that we reach primarily also have a significant comorbidity in addition to HIV. And I can tell you that motion of quiet conversation, but with somebody they have trust in general care or at least developed relationship seem to work. And I've been asking our case managers, it doesn't have to be even medical personnel. We even had like case managers reaching to them. If the conversation goes on to level of medical questions, obviously medical provider joins in. But if it is just a question of um, just logistic, how does it work? Where do I get it? Do I need to come in for a second one? Those questions, and we got feeling just internally discussing, we only have a couple of weeks of experience with that. We obviously had the list ready to go, that it is a sense of I'm cared for. Um, it is about me that seemed to work What when we hear responses back. So like it's my future, <laughs> maybe in the context how we were trying to put it in. So I think what you give example is just brilliant because what you're saying that in one nation it worked from the elder protection motion and that is valuable to them. And I think we really need to try to understand better what is valuable to people and maybe beyond the concept of just you will get ill with the virus. It's what is valuable to you. And I personally would support the motion of letting people understand more consequences of COVID because I think people still think it's just an acute flu-like illness. I don't think many people understand the inflammatory cascade behind it. 
and long-term consequences of disease. Doctor, I think, if I may, thank you for your kind words, I think, and thoughtful words. Um, the last point is one, my son, my daughter, and I have all been um, encouraging people to look at. Um, this is a disease about which there remains great uncertainty about possible long run consequences uh, and that could really come back in a terrible way to bite everyone, bite the healthcare system, bite the costs of providing healthcare. And I've been uh, equally appalled by the extent to which people focused in the last four years on deaths as if infections had no consequence. You can't get sick, you can't die, and you can't have long run COVID or possible later you know, related problems if you don't get infected. And I, I think you know, we need to understand that, focus on it and try to suppress this virus. Um, even given, I think, what we know. The last point on communications is the piece that moved me the most. One of my very dear friends has headed USAID's work on polio eradication for years. And you know, when they were working in Northern India where there was gigantic issues of hesitancy, largely in, in, in a, the large Muslim population in North India, and it was equally true in Northern Nigeria, as I mentioned, they discovered when they looked closer that even though they all knew the principles of communications, they had really not been following them. And so they carefully you know, remapped Northern India. They remapped the number of people who would be at bus stations and border crossings, which in India could be millions on polio day, right? And they then created a very locally uh, oriented approach to ensuring that messages were delivered by whoever basically was the leader. And these are traditional societies. And you know, if you had asked 20 years ago, will India ever eliminate polio? Will Nigeria ever eliminate polio? I think most people would have said, let's, let's not waste, waste time, this is not gonna happen. But certainly central to their doing so was an extraordinarily careful um, effort to map vaccine hesitancy and understand how it was that um, messages could be formulated which would win people's interest in the vaccine. And uh, you know, this has become much more challenging uh, I hear that people are paying more attention to it in the U.S. now than before, but this, I think, will remain a really, a really uh, important issue. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Thank you all who attended. We're at the end of our hour. This was very stimulating discussion. I'm grateful for you to doing the slides. We see so many slides and so many presentations. You made us really feel sitting around the table and having a big humanitarian level conversation way beyond just the medical issues and looking at the lives was a big lens. So we are really grateful for your time. Thank you so much. I see the comment from Dr. Will Woodward, our CRI leadership um, saying that it was terrific presentation, couple of other very positive feedback. Thank you all who took an hour from your time. We are really grateful for this conversation. Richard, thank you again. Um, please send me the pictures of the coyote from your backyard. You promised me. <laughs> thank you all. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> and, let, and let me end by thanking all of you very much. I'm really honored by the invitation. As I mentioned, it's been enlightening and engaging. And uh, Natella, if, if I can share anything with you yes. that uh, will be useful to the Global Health Affinity Group at Children's, please don't hesitate. It will be, and I'm definitely following on that with you, Richard. Thank you Thank so you much, again, from the bottom of our heart. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody.